I am thrilled to be the Law Student Ministries Program Coordinator and get to work with wonderful law students around the country. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our speaker for this evening. Chaplain Major Lee is currently the community chaplain at Fort Belvoir Army Base in Alexandria, Virginia. He has a Bachelor's of Arts in Biblical Studies, a Master's in Professional Ministry, an MBA, and a Doctorate in Law. He was the CLS Chapter President at the University of Hawaii. And Chaplain Major Lee has always brought servant leadership to the community no matter what or where his role has been. His gifts and talents lie in service to others. Prior to the military, he served the community as a financial planner and stockbroker. While in the military, he has been a battalion leader, garrison commander, pastor, CFO for the Religious Service Organization, and combat chaplain. During his military career, he has received military awards and decorations. He is a husband and a father. If you have not already, I encourage you to read Chaplain Major Lee's bio. And in the short time I have known Chaplain Lee, what strikes me is he exemplifies Christ leadership. His superpower is that in the midst of relational conflict, keeping sight of the objective and bringing everyone to the table, feeling heard, seen, and valued, ushering in harmony and accord to the situation. So I'm very excited about what he will impart this evening on applying Christian moral leadership in an organization that is hostile to it. Chaplain Lee, thank you for the service and sacrifice to our country. And we are honored by your time with us this evening. And you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Michelle. It's an honor to be here tonight. Friends, I'm hoping to present to you tonight a guided conversation on the topic of moral leadership. I've taught um, similar topics in MBA programs where I've served as an MBA adjunct professor, and I teach at the Army's War College, um, a class in ethics and morals. I teach a similarly sit situated content. I hope to present some of that to you tonight and hope to get your feedback on um, some of the suggestions I make. Since this is a Christian group, I'm going to have a little more religious content than I would normally um, submit in the presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about moral identity, your moral identity. I'm going to present some case studies that illustrate the intersection of morals and ethics that take these dry concepts and really bring it down into where we're living. And we're going to talk about the practical perspective for how our morals inform our leadership. And then ultimately, I hope that um, brings forth some good quality conversation for us. Um, springboarding on what Michelle has already told you about myself, uh, my resume can be confusing. I have minister's credentials and I have law and business credentials. People wonder why, which one is in the driver's seat. And I wanna tell you about that. Um, and if you ever look at my resume, I divide them by that in a bivocational um, organization because I've always been bivocational. I went right out of high school into the ministry and slept in the basement of a church in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and uh, served as a youth pastor there for three years as I put myself through college. And I realized one day that um, as I'd knock on a hundred doors each, each Saturday and drive a bus, pick up kids and bring about a hundred kids every Sunday morning to the service that I'm never going to quite get married and have a much of a fruitful ministry if I don't also make an income. So I uh, decided that I would make an income and be a tent maker. That was a really good decision. So on top of that bachelor's degree, I did a MBA and later a JD, as most investment bankers have an MB or a JDA, JD, and I did both. 
Um, with the military, they use both. I sit on a board for um, the chaplain corps for the religious accommodation appeals packets that you see in the news for the COVID vaccine packets. I help write army regulations as they um, pertain to religious support. And all the degrees I have have um, deeply uh, been valuable to me and to the communities I support. But without a doubt, what has always been in the driver's seat is the ministry. In our culture here in America, and even globally, as America tends to lead the way, have been founded upon many Judeo-Christian values. And we're seeing a lot of these values in some of these institutions that started on, on those values, becoming at least morally ambivalent and sometimes hostile openly towards what has been a constitutionally protected class. That class is of faith. Class now. We know there's a lot of attacks towards the Judeo-Christian values and a lot of opposition to leaders who try to incorporate uh, Christianity or Christian morals or leadership into their model. As a Christian, we cannot turn off on and off our values or our morals like a light switch when we go to work, right? But neither do we have to um, be like a theologian at work. And um, w- when we try to tell people who Jesus is, I wrote this down, you don't have to answer it like I would in my seminary. You know, Jesus says, he asked somebody in the Bible, who do you say that I am? Uh, in seminary, you might reply, you are the eschatological manifestation of the uh, ground of our being, the kerygma, of which we find the ultimate meaning of our inter- interpersonal relationships. Now, that is a correct theological definition, but it's um, of no value to the average person, right? Not very helpful at all. And in my view, Jesus, if you heard that. <laughs> so uh, at work, And in leadership, a message that doesn't communicate well is of no value at all. So we don't have to lead with our Christianity in a morally ambivalent uh, culture um, in a sense that is uh, blatantly offensive. So the reason I, I titled this Moral Leadership in a Moral Hostage Crisis is to be a pithy little statement that um, draws out some conversation and to give you this word picture of hostage taking. Hostage taking situation. So yeah, there's a crisis that's being negotiated in the terms of what is going on in a hostage situation. There are moral decisions to be made. Someone's rights or desires will probably not be met. But in that hostage situation, and in this analogy, our morals, you can lead an organization as a Christian, though in a moral hostage crisis without compromise. So grounding our moral convictions to a spiritual dimension is grounded in our law in this country in the First Amendment. And I suggest that moral leadership respects diversity and religious freedom. So this training today, seeks to connect your personal values to your Christian values and give you personal guiding convictions with which you can serve your organizations through. Now that we've laid a little bit of the boring groundwork, I'll give you some some thoughts to chew on. I suggest to you that the challenge for Christian leaders is to let our values transform our desires rather than uh, falling into the temptation to let our desires transform our values. See the exact opposite. Because honesty is a learned value. And dishonesty is a denial of that value. And Christians, especially in the legal profession, can go out and just want to get the win. Or in sales, just want to get the win. And definitely in a military career, just want to get the win. And we can either become indifferent, which is a very dangerous thing, 
or in trying to become successful, we might not care how we get there. But as a leader, not only do we affect our own state of being, but our ethical decisions affect others. I suggest as a leader, especially a Christian one, our ethical decisions have to stand the, stand the test of time. And moral leadership will help you to make an ethical decision that will stand the test of time. So now I've got a question for you. I want to uh, put a slide up here I'm going to share with you for a moment. And I want you to be able to answer a question for me, if you'd be gracious enough to chime in. On where do you think that this comes from? So I believe you can see now a value statement from a particular American company. Somebody give me a shout out if you can see my screen. We see it. All right. I can see it. But not completely. But let me let me change my view. Maybe that's um... All right. It says values. We treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. We do not tolerate abuse or disrespectful treatment. Ruthfulness, callousness, and arrogance don't belong here. Integrity. We work with customers and prospects openly and honestly and sincerely. When we say we will do something, we will do it. When we say we cannot or will not do something, then we won't do it. Communication. We have an obligation to communicate. Here we take the time to talk with one another and to listen. We believe that information is meant to move and that information moves people. Excellence. We are satisfied with nothing less than the very best in everything we do. We will continue to raise the bar for everyone. The great fun here will be for all of us to discover just how good we will be. They give the name of the company and it stands for the foundation use. Every employee is ed educated about the company's vision and values and is expected to conduct business with other employees, partners, contractors, suppliers, vendors, customers, keeping in mind respect, integrity, communication, and excellence. Everything we do involves from this company's vision and value statements. At this company, we treat others as we expect to be treated ourselves. You could say that came right from the Bible, right? Doing to others. We the golden rule. We believe in respect for the rights of all individuals and are committed to promoting an environment. I'll go on a little bit here, skip a little bit. We act with the highest professional ethical standards. Agreement, whether contractual or verbal, will be honored. Companies, many public, customers, stockholders, governments, employees, press, and bankers will be conducted in honesty, candor, and fairness. Laws and regulations affecting the company will be obeyed. Even though laws and businesses and practices of foreign nations may differ from those in effect in the U.S., the applicability of the foreign laws, foreign and U.S. laws to the company operations will be strictly observed. Illegal behavior on the part of the employee and the performance of the company du duties will never be abandoned nor tolerated. All right, friends, what do you think this is and where do you think it's from? It's a very famous um, value statement from a very famous American company. I'm gonna guess Amazon. That's a fantastic guess. It is incorrect. Anyone else? Is it a contemporary Ford? company or a historical company? Um, the company existed within your lifetime. It's no longer open, sir. J.C. Penney. Close. That's a, that's an excellent guess. So I'll, I'll no longer hide the ball. I will give it to you. This is Enron's ethics statement. Personally <laughs> <laughs> sent it um, through his through his office of the chairman on July first, two thousand. So I want you to see this, and if you're not familiar with Enron, Enron at its time had the largest scandal in ethics in American corporate history when it went bankrupt because of its illegal activities. I wanna show you the result. 
I always use this in the MBA course I teach and at the uh, War College to show Enron is a case of morals and to also teach you that there's no connection between what you believe and what you know and what you will do. The temptation will be present in all of us over time to start to erode what we believe for success. And every day we have to, to as a Christian, I suggest, uh, make our decision to be who we want to be again. I know personally, my prayers go like this every day. God, help me to be a good man today, a good chaplain today, a good husband today, a good father today. Not to th say anything incredibly stupid to man to my wife today. Amen. Because if we did do everything we knew to do and believe, we all would have gone to the gym at some point today and ate a salad for lunch. We would all be thin and healthy and live up to our highest expectations of knowledge. But I assure you, we are not. Because there's a disconnect between what we know and what we do. And perhaps nothing is more important in life than to make that connection constantly with our values that will eventually flesh out in our morals. So I present to you Enron's scandal here. Although their ethics were pristine and they claimed as many corporations today do in America, these same moral values, yet company after company is going bankrupt. This is not um, unique to Enron. So much so, every law school student will take a, a fantastic ethics exam and every business student will take an ethics course in this country. And ethics is a big part of what we do, but it will not matter. Your moral test will still come, and so will mine. And you must be prepared to pass. So let's talk more about that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So as leaders, we're going to be tempted to put our thumbs on the scale. Enron from 1985 to 2002, and he was sentenced to prison, but he died six weeks after his sentencing for his involvement with Enron, and he died of a heart attack at age 64 from all the stress of this. And I suggest to you, friends, that your morals and your character will keep what your hard work has earned you. And you can take a lifetime to earn your JD and your credentials and build your resume. And you can lose it all in a moment of moral failure. See, it took Enron 16 years to go from $10 billion in assets to $65 billion in assets. But it took them just 24 days to go bankrupt <clears throat> because that's how long it took their unethical practices, practices to go public. At Enron, Ken Lay received his tests in ethics and morals and failed and 70 billion dollars was lost in private assets from investors and um, the employees lost two billion in their retirement assets because they had it uh, tied up in enron itself this was all possible because of the fraud they co cooperated with arthur anderson the number one trusted accounting firm in the world they were partnered together in the fraud. So by misrepresenting Enron's earning reports through its fraudulent partner, the separate firm, Arthur Anderson, they provided revenue to investors that was not true. They embezzled funds from investments while reporting fraudulent earnings. And then they mishandled their employees' uh, funds. All of it immoral, all of it ethical. They stated one thing, they were doing the opposite. It brings me to this question, friends. What do you believe? What is your moral identity? Are you a moral leader? Or is your thumb currently on the scale? Is there a disconnect between what you know and what you are doing right now? Where if we print it on what you're doing, would you be ashamed?
you shouldn't be. I now want to give you a um, biblical illustration. And the biblical illustration will come in Exodus 2 and Acts 7, 22 of Moses. Because Moses lived in a moral hostage situation. Moses is one of the greatest religious heroes of all Christians. What really shocked me over the years of my ministry was when I made this connection in Acts 7.22. It really blew me away. I thought he didn't know that he was called to deliver the Egyptians from Egypt when he was an Egyptian. But Acts 7.22 says he knew. Let me read it to you. So, but before I do that, Moses had a miracle. That miracle was he, his mother put him in the reeds and saved his life. He floats up the river. Pharaoh had no son, according to Josephus, the historian. So he raises a Jew not knowing it. The very child he thought um, he had ordered, to be, the, that class of child he thought to be killed, he raises now as his own son to be heir to the Egyptian throne. Moses, according to Josephus, was to be the next Pharaoh. This is a miracle. So Moses has to deal with soon, what do I do when my miracle dies? Because he will soon become an exile and lose it all. Acts 7.22, it says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, he came to the and it came into the heart, his heart, to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. See, that's it. Right there in uh, Acts 7, 25. He supposed his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand but they did not understand moses understood already at that time when he killed the egyptian and buried in the in the sand that god was going to deliver the jews from egypt through moses probably he, he figured this out when he would become pharaoh and on the following day he appeared to them um as they were, were quarreling and tried to reconcile them saying men you are brothers why do you wrong each other but the man who was wronged had wronged his neighbor, thrust him aside, saying, who made you the ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At the retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, and he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, he, he sees. My point here is this. Moses had his calling correct. He was correct. God would deliver the children of Israel from Egypt through him. His calling was identified correctly, as many of you have recognized the call of God on your life. But what's astounding to me, if you read now in, uh, which I won't take the time to do here today, Exodus 2, at the same account of the murder, it says Moses looked left, he looked right, right. and when he didn't see any Egyptians he uh, watching, he killed that Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. Isn't that interesting? He looked left, he looked right, but he never looked up. And that's just like us as Christians. When we act on God's will, man's way, we'll look left and right at all the means of the world, but we'll never do our prayers. We'll never look up to, down to the word of God. And we will also have secrets buried in the sand and things will end disastrously. 40 years later, he comes back to Egypt and he does God's will, God's way. And he delivers all of the Jews from Egypt. So you may be at a place where you feel like you've sensed your calling, but things aren't going right. Maybe you've looked left and right, but you've never looked up. Maybe you've had your moral crisis where you have ex explored your leadership and you've made the connection to your calling, but you haven't connected back to your faith and you haven't connected what you think from what you do, yourself like uh, the CEO at Enron did. But Ken Lay, I want to remind you, he took through his appropriations and he lost even his life after he faced the consequences from a lifetime of success. These were good people. 
that at some point made an ethical and moral choice that ruined everything. See, right and wrong is easy. Ethics aren't right about or aren't about right or wrong or black and white. There's no debate about that. What is harder and what I mean about discussing ethics that are going to inform what you do, your morals, is that gray area, that place which right and wrong doesn't really clearly exist. And I don't care what decision you often make in the gray area. What I care about is that you had a process for it, that you did your prayers, that you are a Christian leader, that you took the time to be intentional. So as we bring this to a close, I want you to keep in mind that ethics are not synonymous with legal. What is legal? That's usually a cop out when people say, well, it's legal. You often hear that. Well, my retort to that with my peers is yes. Keep in mind that about 12 million Jews died legally in Nazi Germany during the Holocaust, but it wasn't ethical, but it was legal under German law. What is legal isn't the same thing as what is uh, ethical or moral. You may have the right to do it. It does not make it right. So going with the flow can be the worst thing you can do. And we have leaders that are moral cowards. I'll give you another illustration. You're going to have to decide as a Christian leader what hill you want to die on. And it shouldn't be every hill. I know as an investment banker, uh, I worked at a finance institution for 10 years. I had an account one day for uh, Planned Parenthood that I was told to open. And my supervisor came in and said I had to open the account for them. I said, I, I can't do it. Would you please give it to another um, banker? And they, they wouldn't do it. I said, look, I won't lift one paper clip uh, for an abortion clinic. And maybe you feel differently. That's my, my view on it. I won't lift one paper clip for an abortion clinic. They said, it's your job. You'll do it. I said, all right. Then I resigned. And I stood up and I walked out the door. They followed me out the door. And they said, come back in, come back in. So you have to know who you are and what lines you will cross and will not cross. And then in all fairness, I'll show you the exact same fact pattern, similarly situated, in which I think um, where I was hypocritical, working in college for uh, UPS, loading buses, loading their, their packages. I had Planned Parenthood packages coming down off the slide and I loaded the Planned Parenthood packages on the UPS uh, trucks. I didn't walk off the job there and I was a complete hypocrite. So I got it right or wrong one and wrong on the other. So I won't make myself out to be a, a hero there. So everybody has to decide where their line is, where, where there's that gray area. You're gonna have to pray about that. But have you ever drawn a line in the sand at all? Under what circumstances? You need to know what your morals are. You need to know who you are. And you need to be consistent. I suggest to you that all those statements of faith, uh, statements that you read, um, the company has, well, ethics are the trump card of every transaction. But you're going to have to have your own morals. You're going to see that they're very seldom applied. So I don't want to take up too much time today. And I'm going to stop with, you need to make sure that your decisions are compassionate, that as a Christian leader, that you have accountability, that they're in the pursuit of excellence, that you're exercising self-restraint and control. Was your decision respectful and fair? Was your process impartial? Was it honest? Quite often I write my email and I'll ask my team, are we being honest? And I read the email and say, nope, that's, that's not the truth. And, I, and when I read it and think about it, it wasn't completely honest and I have to rewrite the email. Number four, was it consistent with our, our citizenship? Does it respect the values we have for our community? A good citizen knows the laws and obeys them. And does it stand the test of time? Would, would this decision or this email, if I printed it in the newspaper and had to read it tomorrow in the morning, that this is the decision I made, would I be comfortable reading? And the last question I need to ask myself is, am I lying to myself? Don't
don't lie to yourself. You should do what's right for no other reason than that is right. What is right doesn't always work, but it does not change the the fact that it is the right thing to do.